Amen, amen, amen. We're looking at John 18 today, and <clears throat> mind you, we're looking at the arrest of our Lord. And while there are so many things you can unpack from this chapter, I mean, you can do a five, six week series and each week distill and have a different topic you're going after, the one that jumps out the most, first and foremost, is that God's word will always be fulfilled. God's word is true. If you want to write that in your notes, and if you think you're at a point where you just don't need to hear that anymore, well then, tell your neighbor, because I'm sure your neighbor wants to hear it again, and then tell your neighbor to tell you anyway. God's word is true. Two, God keeps his word. God keeps his word toward us. God's word is true. God keeps his word. God keeps his word toward us. You know, when the Israelites were brought out of Egypt, they came out as a very small band of people compared to the nations of the world. God even said in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7, the Lord did not pick you, Israel, because you were some mighty nation, because you were some swagged out group or some group that just looked like a group of barbarians and green berets. He says, paraphrasing, actually, you're the smallest of all nations. You're the, you're the wimpiest of all nations. The Lord picked you because he loves you. And when he redeemed his people, and it says he gave Egypt for their ransom, meaning Egypt went from looking like this colossal, immovable superpower to being flipped upside down in just a course of, of, of hours. He gave Egypt for their ransom. The things that man love, God just completely flipped it as in a moment. Brings them out into the wilderness. First thing he does is teaches them how to worship. And teaches them that worship must always be on the grounds of blood sacrifice. The sacrifice of an innocent substitute must always be the grounds upon which God's people approach him. The only way God's sinful people can approach him is on the grounds of a sinless or spotless sin substitute being taken out in their place and the blood being shed. Then the Lord begins to say stuff to them like, you will lack nothing in this desert. Uh, one of you will put a hundred to flight. Uh, all of your enemies will be toppled. I'm going to take you into a land that flows with milk and with honey. Uh, I will send my terror before you. He even says, I will send the hornet in front of you. And when you get into the land, it's going to be at the time of harvest. There's going to be grapes already on the vines. There's going to be ears of corn already on the stalks. Houses will already be built and furnished. And I'm going to give you all these things. Giants and demon worshiping entities that receive paranormal strength akin to when the demon possessed man was breaking chains in the days of Jesus. But you will be the head and not the tail and you will overcome. He gave them a lot of promises and to them the promises seemed too big and too grand and sweeping. Too good to be true. They didn't believe. But doesn't it say in the word that even when we believe not, God is still faithful. And I love this verse. And if you are just a student of the books of Moses, you must know this verse because God does fulfill his promise. Even when they're faithless, God is still faithful. And then look at this verse in Joshua 23, verse 14. Joshua is saying to them, And behold, this day I'm now going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls, look at this, that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All are come to pass, not one thing has failed. Amen? God's word is true. God's word must be fulfilled. God's word is true for you, true for me, true for us. Let's go to John 18 now. And we are now zeroed in on the arrest of our Lord. He is arrested to be crucified. This is why he came down. So that he who knew no sin could become our sin. 
so that we could be made the righteousness of God. Do you realize today that if you're a born again Christian, though you are a sinner through and through, if you are truly regenerated as a born again believer, if you have repented of your sins, placed your faith in the gospel and invited the risen Christ into your heart, you are the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God. Now do you understand why it says in Hebrews 4.16, come boldly to the throne of grace? You are able to enter directly into his presence because when he looks at you coming to him, the father is looking at the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. Even if you're coming and in a moment, you feel like you're looking like the exact opposite of Jesus. It says you come boldly because because of the gospel and because of the gospel alone, we have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. These are all those kind of verses that say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. This is why we should continue to be so ecstatic to be his, to be forgiven, to be the recipients of the gospel. So we're here in John 18 and we looked last week how it's really a tale of two cups. It's really a tale of two gardens, right? Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane knowing that Judas is on the way with some 600 soldiers and officers with weapons and torches and he's on the ground and he's praying and he says, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And we talked about what cup is he referring to? He's referring to the cup of God's wrath. Basically, he takes that cup. And because he took that cup that we should have drank, because he drank the cup of the Father's wrath for our sins in our place, the only cup left for us is the cup he offered in the upper room, the cup of salvation. And he said, take this cup and drink all of it. This is my blood that is shed for you. And in the Greek, he doesn't just say drink the cup. He says drink all of it. Remember last week we talked about, are we really drinking all of it? Are we truly taking in all of what it means to be a forgiven, set apart, holy child of the Father? Or are we just taking baby sips? Also, it's a tale of two gardens. In the Garden of Eden, Adam said, not God's will be done, but mine be done. In the Garden of Eden, Adam ran from the presence of the Lord. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is the last Adam. He's called the last Adam because he came to make right what the first Adam made wrong. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the last Adam who comes to reverse the curse, he does the exact opposite. He says, not my will, but your will be done. And when the soldiers come to arrest him, he doesn't run. Rather, he comes and shows himself and says, who are you looking for? So it's really a tale of two cups, a tale of two gardens. And we looked at last week when Peter decides to pull a sword out and chops off the high priest's servant's ear, that actually he wasn't trying to cut his ear off. He was trying to split his head. But just shows you how without God we can't do anything right. And even when you try to split a wig, it just ends up cutting someone's ear off. But the thing is, Peter should have been crucified right next to Jesus for doing that. But what does Jesus do when it's his last public miracle? He heals Malchus's ear. And last week we had a great message and a wonderful communion. I recommend you listen to the message, you know, healing life's mistakes. When the Lord heals our, mi our mistakes, our dumb mistakes, our oh my gosh, I did it again mistakes. And after he heals Malchus's ear, there's no record. And what Peter deserved, he does not even get. And we've, so we're really right now, what, if you want to sum up, what are we doing here right now? We're really making sure that we're making the main thing the main thing, which is the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and what it means from the moment you first call on Jesus as Lord and Savior, what it means your first week as a believer, your first year as a believer, your first five years as a believer, your first 10 years. What does it mean through the ups and the downs, the right turns and the sharp left turns, the valleys of the shadow of death, you know, as you're battling the world, the flesh and the devil, what does the gospel mean in every one of these contexts? 
Because I do believe that what is a problem in the church, and I'll say the American church of today, is that we understand the gospel in how to be saved from a sinner's hell and how to get to a heaven we don't deserve. But when it comes to applying the gospel to our everyday life, to our thought life, to the flesh, to our growth, to all things that befall us, it reflects that we're not keeping the main thing the main thing. So Jesus is now arrested, and let's read. It says in John 18, and we'll look at verse 12, it says, Then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Why does God hate religious hypocrisy? God hates little sin. Maybe it's a better question to say, why does God hate what seems like harmless sins? God knows that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So why would God hate even the smallest dose of religious hypocrisy? Because what God sees is what it can become. When you look at these Pharisees and you look at what they are doing to God in the flesh, all the while quoting all the right verses and looking as religious as can be, they're breaking so many rules in the name of upholding the scriptures. Do you know any believers that do that? That basically strain at gnats but swallow camels? Do you, get, do you know what that comes from? You see, it said in the Old Testament that you could not eat the blood or eat an unclean animal. So, if a religious Jewish person got a mosquito in their throat, they would start basically trying to make themselves cough it up. You know, you'd hear them gagging on it because they don't want to take in this unclean animal and, and this blood. But then they would turn around and just eat like an entire camel. Now, a mosquito, unclean. A camel, unclean. How big is a mosquito that they would be choking lest they swallow this thing? But turning right around and while making sure not to swallow the mosquito, taking in a whole camel hook, line, and sinker, what was he basically saying to them? You guys major on the minors, but totally, totally fail in the majors. Here, they're upholding their traditions and their religiosity and the way they play church, but everything they are doing, the lying, binding Jesus when he hadn't even been tried yet, we're going to see that they're going to start setting up court at night. Can you imagine, what would be your reaction if you found out that the judges of the city and city officials all ran, you know, basically in a corner of the city under I-95 in South Philly and had court at night to deal with something and a person was just cuffed and dragged there. This is all of what they're doing. But they're singing all the right songs. They've got the nice blue around the garments. You know, they're holding the garments close to their body so they don't brush against, you know, the unclean Gentile and all these different things. But they are breaking every single rule in the book. You know, in Luke chapter 2, verse 35, write that verse down. Luke 2, verse 35. Remember when Simeon is prophesying to Mary? as Mary is dedicating the eight-day-old Jesus in the temple? What does Simeon say? He says to the mother, first, this child will be for the rising of the nation. But then he says to the mother, and a sword is going to go through your own heart. Meaning, what's going to happen to him is going to feel like a sword being driven through your body, mom. But it says, but it's going to happen so that the thoughts and intents of people's hearts can be revealed. You see, what this is showing is what's really inside man. Jesus comes down, does nothing wrong. The most remarkable human to ever walk the earth by far. Does nothing wrong, nothing but love. Total honor, total honoring God. And man turns around, and what do they give him? Their absolute worst. And it really highlights Luke 2.35. It says, a sword is going to go through your own heart, Mary, but it's going to happen so that the intents and hearts of people can be made manifest. 
this story, the crucifixion, all of what takes place this night before and the next day shows what's really inside of every one of us. And it's Martin Luther who said, every one of us carries his nails in our back pocket. So they bind him. Verse 13, they led him away to Annas first because he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was high priest that same year. You had your Supreme Court of Israel was a group called the Sanhedrin. It was 70 men, and it was believed that Saul of Tarsus, before becoming the Apostle Paul, was part of the Sanhedrin. It was 70 men plus one. The one was the high priest. Only thing is that Caiaphas and Annas, as they were related, Neither of them wanted to step down from their position. So now you've got like two high priests, basically. So you can even just see nepotism, family members just keeping family members along. It's clearly religion where you're quoting all the verses, but you're clearly doing what you want to do. Because you know you could take a verse of the Bible out of context and justify about anything, right? When it's taken out of context. So they lead him to Annas first, and it's nighttime. He was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was high priest that year. Verse 14, now Caiaphas was he that gave counsel to the Jews and said that it was expedient that one should die for the people. Mind you, they wanted Jesus dead for a long time. Why? Because they loved having the spotlight. They loved having the chief seats so badly that they didn't want to give it up to nobody. Not even if God should come down in the flesh and it obviously be his, right? And Simon Peter, verse 15, followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known to the high priest, and he went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door on the outside. Then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spoke unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter." It's talking about Peter and this other disciple. Who is the other disciple? It's John. But John is writing in a humility because he's the author of the book of John. He's not saying, hey, I'm the one that went up to the high priest and was like, yo, let Peter in. Then went back to the door and was like, you know what's interesting? Yes, we know that the disciples were regarded as uneducated fishermen, right? And I think in our minds, and mind you, they were called that, not because they had low IQs, not because uh, they had two left feet. It was because they hadn't attended the religious schooling down in the south in Judea. So I think in our minds, we kind of get this idea that the disciples were all just like standing around with their pockets turned inside out with just lint balls, you know what I mean? And, you know, basically like, you know, I don't know, cooking ramen noodles like 1,800 different ways the way I did growing up as a kid, you know what I mean? All these things, but you know what's interesting is it appears that John and James, you know, because it's almost like, yeah, well, yeah, they all followed Jesus. They didn't have nothing else to do anyway, <laughs> you know? He found them up in Galilee, like they're all just sitting on bales of hay, sleep. He's like, yo, follow me, and they're like, Psh, beats boredom, <laughs> let's follow him. But that's not the truth. Why does John, why is John known by the high priest? Why is John known at the door? Why does John from Galilee have the kind of pull where he can go up to the door and to the high priest and be like, yo, my man Peter, he's with me. Like when people go in the club and it's like, yo, that's my entourage or whatever. Let's dig into this a little bit. Remember when Jesus called James and John, they were mending nets and they were fishermen? And it said that they followed Jesus and left Jesus and the hired servants. Clearly, it was a family fishing business. When you have employees, you know your business has just gone to another level. Your startup now has employees, right? Basically, John and his brother had the business of salting fish and bringing the best of fish from Galilee and selling it down to the rich. They basically were like the connection to Whole Foods. That's why it's believed that the high priest and all these people knew who John was. What a beautiful picture that is now. Doesn't that change our whole notion of, yeah, 12 disciples who basically were on a road to nowhere fast, just decided to follow Jesus, and you realize... No, there were those that walked away from what the world would consider a future that the, the, the world was their oyster. 
So it's very interesting to look at that. I encourage you to study that a little bit. But that's not the point. Let's keep going. So the damsel, verse 17, that kept the door, she said to Peter, aren't you one of that man's disciples? He said, I am not. That is one of the denials. When we get into next week's message on temptation, we'll be focusing more on that. And the servants and the officers stood there who had made a fire of coals for it was very cold and they warmed themselves and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Uh, we'll get into that next week as well. Peter uh, is following from a distance and warming himself at the world's coals. So obviously he's setting himself up to fail in temptation. That's next week's message again. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. So now they have Jesus. They're having a court session at night. And what they're trying to do is condemn Jesus, but they want to condemn him as an enemy of the state so that the Romans would crucify him. So they're trying to catch him in his words, raising up witnesses. They can't even get their stories together. Basically, you know, when two witnesses can't get their testimony to agree, the person's supposed to be set free at that moment. But obviously, this is a crazy, this is the worst trial a human has perhaps been subjected to. If you see what our Lord is doing. But here, let's remember this. He did all of this for us. All of this for us. Not because of one word he misspoke, not because of one evening when he was tired and just, you know, or saw a Roman soldier abusing someone and just cursed Rome aloud. He did nothing wrong. He's doing all of this for us. And Isaiah 53 said, as a sheep does not speak before its shearers, so when our Lord would go to the butcher house as the lamb to be slain for our sins, he would not speak. And the reason is if the, he did speak, he would have to say who really was guilty. He would have to say my name. He would have to say your name. He'd have to bring up my blasphemies, your blasphemies. So, the disciples, verse 19, asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered verse 20 and said, I spoke openly to the world. I even taught in the synagogue and in the temple where the Jews always resort. In secret, I've said nothing. Why are you asking me? Why don't you ask those that heard me what I've said unto them? Behold, they know what I've said. And when he had this spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand. He cocks back and just punches God in the mouth and says, you dare answer the high priest that way? Jesus answered him and said, if I've spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. If I've done something wrong, bear witness, share what it is. But if I've done well, why did you hit me? Now Annas had sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So now Annas sends him from his little corner over to Caiaphas. All of this happening at night. Verse 25, Simon Peter stood and warmed himself back to Peter. They said therefore unto him, are you not also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest being related to the one whose ear Peter cut off. He said, did not I see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied again and immediately the rooster crowed just as Jesus said would happen. Luke tells us that at that moment, Jesus bound and in the trial looks across the room, looks at Peter. Peter sees Jesus's eyes and it says he runs out into the night and he weeps bitterly. That's a whole other message. But for those that love celebrating the gospel of grace of how a man can go from denying Jesus three times to next being used to lead 3,000 people to Christ in his very first sermon, make sure that you insert in the middle what's supposed to be there. He deeply repented of his sin. He did not just go from failure and, oh my goodness, I'm a failure. Guess I'm ready to start a revival or something now. That's not the formula. The formula is going low and repenting of the sin. God restores him. That's another message. Like I said, there's so many messages within John 18. Verse 28, then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the hall of judgment. 
And it was early now, but they themselves would not go into the judgment hall lest they should be defiled, but so that they could eat the Passover. Mind you, the Passover is now upon them. They're taking him now to Pilate, but they don't want to walk on Gentile territory or what's considered Gentile jurisdiction lest they be ceremonially unclean and can't play church and keep their religious uh, observation. I mean, do you see the hypocrisy of this all? I'll tell you guys, honestly, in my early Christian walk, whenever I would read about this type of religious hypocrisy, I'd start with TV first. Oh, well... <laughs> I wonder what preachers on TV I can apply this to. One, two, three, five, ten, twenty. You get my point. Then you start moving around as a believer. You start meeting some other people. And then it's like, oh, well, I've seen it here. Though this reminds me of this person and this person and this. And, but prayer, and they need prayer, and they need prayer. And hey, can we pray for them? I just read about religious hypocrisy. I will tell you this. I'm at a stage in my walk now being a believer for 20 years and you come to just know that everything in that Bible is in your heart. And now when I'm looking at stuff like this, I'm not, I don't have time to think about, you know, this, that, or a third, or person A, B, or C, or where so-and-so, and man, I hope so-and-so comes to church to hear this one. This is, Lord God, may I hate this in me first and foremost lest I ever fall in that trap of being the hypocrite that Jesus talks about when it says that you're trying to take a speck out of someone else's eye and don't even see the telephone pole beam that is in your own eye. So we've always got to apply this to us first. Religious hypocrisy is a scary thing. Do you think any of them, when they got in the office, said, hey, you know, we're kind of set on their resume, what they've done, and then on the bottom, hobbies and interests, hobbies and interests. Becoming a religious hypocrite. Does anyone plan that? Does anyone aspire to that? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. So they take him to the hall of judgment. Verse 29, Pilate, who was the governor... He now comes out. He's the Roman governor. But see, during the religious festivals in Israel, there were known to be uprisings because the Jewish people would get a lot of nationalism in the midst of the celebration. The numbers would swell because you had Jewish people coming from North Africa and from the Middle East and from up above in the far north. So the nationalism and the pride of who they were would swell up that there tended to be riots. So Rome would make sure that the governor was right in Jerusalem when this is happening. That's why Pilate is there. Pilate's an interesting guy. He is a, a weak politician. He's really trying to please everyone. He's a man pleaser. Um, he doesn't want to be disliked. He likes his job at Rome. Uh, and basically, he's just looking for a loophole. But if you read portions of Luke, he could also be a very nasty man when he wanted to. Remember they were referring to Pilate, you know, having people slaughtered and mixing their blood in some grotesque way. So he had a heavy hand, but he was a weak man. So now, here's Pilate, and here it is, verse 29. Pilate says, what accusations do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, huh, if he were not a malefactor, we wouldn't be here. They have nothing to say, so it's all generalities, basically. They're like, hey, what is the direct instance? What do you have to point out that this man has done? Well, hey, we wouldn't be standing here if there wasn't a problem, right? So interesting. Verse 31, then said Pilate to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. He's saying, this isn't a Roman issue. This sounds like you guys arguing of your own religion. You go deal with him. The Jews therefore said to him, it's not lawful for us to put any man to death because the Romans had basically really put a clamp on the Jews being able to exercise capital punishment. But let me ask you, what was the form of capital punishment that the nation of Israel used? Stoning. Here's the thing though. What did the Bible predict going all the way back to the times of King David? In Psalm 22, how did King David predict that the Messiah would die for our sins? They pierced my hands and feet. Crucifixion. King David wrote that in Psalm 22 before crucifixion had even been invented yet. 
And here, Pilate says, you go judge them. The Jews say, well, we can't kill anyone. And it says in verse 12, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Jesus said he would be crucified. King David prophesied hundreds of years beforehand that he would be crucified. Would you go back to what we first touched on in the beginning with the verse in Joshua? All of God's word must be fulfilled. How many times in Jesus' earthly ministry did it seem like it was about to go this way, but it says it went this way because it wasn't time yet? What about when Mary and Joseph are in another place, but it says in Micah chapter 5 verse 2 that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. What happens in Luke chapter 2? It says the king's hands in the heart of the Lord and he could turn it any which way he will. Mary is about to deliver a child. The Bible predicts in Micah 5 2, hundreds of years beforehand, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Only thing is she's in her third term and she is not in Bethlehem. And guess what? They don't have Uber, they don't have Lyft, and they definitely don't have little puddle jumper jets. How do you get the Messiah in Bethlehem in time to be born? It says that in Luke chapter 2, Caesar just decides to tax the entire world and wants to take a census and everyone ASAP had to report to the city of their genealogy. Boom. God's word is true. God's word must be fulfilled. God's word must be fulfilled in our life. You see, you could tell if this message is already grabbing you today because you're already starting to look at situations in your life and you're already making a beeline to some promises that you need to be applying to your life with the same confidence of knowing that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and his word must be fulfilled. God's word is true. God's word must be fulfilled. God's word must be fulfilled in our life. So then it says in verse 33, Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said to him, are you king of the Jews? Now, interestingly, Jesus is on trial, right? But who's really on trial here? Jesus? Or is it the nation? And is it Pilate? Pilate soon realizes that he's actually the one on trial. He says, are you the king of the Jews? Verse 34, Jesus says to him, are you saying this of yourself or did others tell it to you concerning me? Isn't it interesting that God always gets down to the bottom line of, hey, are you just saying what others are saying or do you really believe this? Are you coming up to receive Christ uh, at the altar at the end of the service because your girlfriend is doing it? Or are you doing it because you truly know that you are a sinner in need of a savior? Jesus is cutting right to the chase there. Pilate verse 35 says, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you unto me. What have you done? No doubt Pilate is seeing supernatural peace. And basically he's saying, this doesn't make sense. Your whole nation is outside wanting you dead. And you're interrogating me on whether I'm quoting hearsay or what I believe in my own heart about you. You see how the tables are completely turning? Pilate's starting to realize that he's on trial now. Jesus isn't on trial. And interestingly, this is when you'll start to see Pilate starts, he's trying to set Jesus free until... The Jewish rulers get the whole crowd to say, if you don't do this, you're not Caesar's friend, we'll go to Rome on you. And basically, Pilate chooses his job, his social life, and his financial stability seemingly over receiving truth and giving his life to Jesus Christ. And don't you see that happen so much today? How many people understand the truth in Christ, realize that Christ is who he says he is? There's only one thing. Their social life will radically have to change. Their job may have to change. All of what they have known, what their life, the culture their life is submerged in, may have to radically change. And there be those that say, you know something? Uh, I'm too friendly with Caesar for that. So, 
He says, what have you done? In verse 36, Jesus answered and said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight. Now you see why when Peter pulled out the sword and chopped off Malchus's ear, Jesus says in another gospel, Peter, put up your sword. You know, this is not the way we do this. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. Then would my servants fight? If my kingdom were of this world, he's saying I'd have an army put together also consisting of 72,000 angels to show you something you've never seen before, but it's not. And it says, this is so I should be delivered, not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not far from hence. How is God's kingdom manifest on the earth right now? We know that we're instructed to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're instructed to pray for the second coming of Christ. And at which time, his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When Christ returns, earth will become a mirror image of heaven. And we're to pray for that. But when does the kingdom of God begin on planet earth? How is it being manifested right now? In the church. And let's get even more specific. Great answer. In the heart of every submitted born again believer. As you walk the earth. Speaking of your invisible king. Who is king of kings and lord of lords. And saying God willing I'll see you tomorrow. Hey this been good by God's grace. If it's God's will this will happen. You know hey I believe this will please the Lord. You know something I believe this is grieving the Lord. Let's seek to please the Lord. Lord may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable. You are showing the world that you are submitted to a king and a kingdom. You are showing the kingdom of God. The Bible says that we are walking epistles. You you may be the only Bible somebody ever reads. You may be the only Bible someone ever reads. And as they look at your conduct, look at what you speak of and how you submit to him, they are seeing a picture of what the kingdom of God will look like when Christ visibly returns and sits upon a throne in Israel. So the kingdom of God begins in each of us. As we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. Isn't that just a beautiful thing? We are a manifestation of the kingdom of God. That'd be a great segue into warfare. And why the enemy wants to come at every believer the way he does. But you might say, you know, oh, enemy wouldn't want to attack me. I mind my business. I'm not on social media. I stay in my own lane. I'm an introvert. I'm the last person in a place, the first person out. I don't even have a ministry. Why would the enemy come at me? Well, you see, we're thinking about it all in the natural. When the enemy looks at any believer who has called upon the name of the Lord, you are a manifestation of the kingdom of God, the very kingdom that spells his doom and defeat. The Bible says, do not be ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11. Too many believers are ignorant of his devices. And what you're doing is you're thinking about it in the natural. Your softball coach told you you didn't make the team. Your basketball coach put you on the bench. So you've just taken on this notion, well, because I've always been on the bench. When I was in high school, we called it riding pine. If you sat on the bench, you were riding pine. It's like, hey, us five, we're in the game starting five. No, 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 you're not, no, no. The coach said you're riding pine. You know what I mean? Right? It means you're just sitting on a pine bench for the all four periods, all four, four quarters, right? High schoolers could be so loving to one another, right? So edifying and uplifting one another, right? But what happens is you start to come to the Lord with this mentality of, well, I never made any teams I tried out for. Coaches saw me as insignificant for the battle. Uh, So why would the enemy even consider me a threat? But you realize it's not about you. It's Christ in you. So it says in Peter, gird up the loins of your mind. It says basically, get your head right and understand the battle that all of us are in and don't be ignorant of his devices. There's some stuff that some of y'all are going through and while it definitely calls for maybe leaning on a brother or sister, maybe even crying on the shoulder of a brother or sister, letting a brother or a sister lay hands and pray, there's also a place where for some of you it just involves you straight rebuking the devil from around your life and out of your house. And look, 
Just because it doesn't say Antioch of Christian Fellowship of Holiness Temple, don't think for a minute that we don't rebuke the devil up in here. And don't think for a minute that we won't cast a demon out of somebody up in here. Because we know what the Bible teaches. Much love to my Pentecostal brothers and sisters. So let's zero in and we're going to start to bring it home. Pilate says to him in verse 37, are you a king then? Jesus answered and says, you say that I'm a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate then says to him, look at this, what is truth? And when he said this, he went out again to the Jews and says to him, I find no fault in him. You know what was interesting is that every Passover, they were to take a lamb, right? The lamb had to be in the prime of its life because each lamb of the Passover pointed to Christ who would be crucified in the prime of his life. The lamb had to be inspected. The lamb had to live in the home with the family for four days. Our Lord didn't just come down and go straight to a cross. Three and a half years, just as you had the lamb for four days and he became the family pet, and you got to see those beautiful brown eyes for three and a half years, we fell in love with Jesus and he became a part of us. The lamb had to be examined and make sure it didn't have any blemish, no mange marks, nothing at all, because the blemishless lamb pointed to the sinless Christ. So the priest would examine the lamb and say, there is no blemish. Do you understand that here is Jesus Christ, the true Passover lamb, and when Pilate comes out and says, I find no fault in this man, the, pa the true Passover lamb has just passed all scrutiny as being absolutely sinless. Everything here is happening, line upon line, precept upon precept, in just decent, proper, perfect order. Who's running the show of the whole crucifixion? So when I hear people say, oh, Jesus is a punk because he went to the cross and, you know, when he got punched, he didn't punch back. What did he say to Peter? Peter, don't you know that I could call down 12 legions of angels right now? 6,000 makes one legion. It means when Jesus was going through all of that, 72,000 angels were on standby. So if he just sighed, Let's get it on. They would have come down, but you see people mistake meekness for weakness. Meekness is when you have the strength to do that and more and you don't. Meekness is not weakness. And if you think meek is weak, try being meek for a week. If you think being meek is weak, try being meek for a week. Our Lord, perfect in meekness. But let's look at this here and let's, let's wrap up. And this will take us just into this, this thing with truth. So look, the, the first part of the message was what? God's word is true. God's word must be fulfilled. He's like, you guys kill him. No, we can't kill him. You know why? Because the scripture said he had to be crucified. And real quick, would you write down Deuteronomy, please? Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23. You know what it said? That the person who is cursed must be hung on a tree. A cross. Deuteronomy. Obviously the cross was not invented yet, but it was to be cursed was to be hung on a tree. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says Christ was made a curse for us being hung on a tree. God's word is true. God's word must be fulfilled. That is why when Pilate says to the Jews, well, you guys take him and deal with your, him your own way. And they're like, okay, well, we'll just stone him. God's word said that he would be crucified and take our curse for us, so it must be done this way. God's word is true. God's word must be fulfilled. God's word must be fulfilled in our life. And just real quick again, what are you going through in your life? And do you have the accompanying scriptures to hold his promises? 
Doesn't it say in Psalms 119, your word has been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage, saying, while I'm on this pilgrim journey of highs and lows and this and that, rough and smooth places, your words have been my songs. Are you taking God's word? If you believe it's true, if you believe it must be fulfilled, and that it must be fulfilled in your life, are you applying God's word to your life? And going to war with God's promises. You see, the Bible takes on a whole different place in your heart when you start seeing it as a weapon to wage war with. Oh, it's a nightlight to keep you comfortable at night when you're scared. It's a tissue when you got tears, right? It's an anchor when you're in the storm. But it is a weapon. It is a weapon. And brothers and sisters, we've got to get back to using the word of God as a weapon to claim promises and to stand on the word of God. Now do you see why it says in Hebrews 11:6, without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God, you've got to believe that he is and that he rewards those that diligently seek him. I can remember my earlier days as a believer, and those were some of the hardest days I could always be found with an assignment pad in my back pocket. And what it was, was it was all the promises that applied to all of what I was going through for calling on the name of the Lord. Basically, life completely changed in a million and one ways. But in that notepad were promises, loaded promises. And what did I do when I was bored? I pulled out my little notepad and I just read promises and stood on them. Read them, stood on them, put it back in the pocket. Whenever I was bored, pulled it out again. Found another promise, wrote it down. The promises grew. Soon I didn't have to carry the assignment pad because I had them memorized so I could just be thinking them. I could still quote them to this day because I sat there and I polished them in my heart that much day and night. And I made them my song in the house of my pilgrimage. And I want to tell you something. Not one of those promises failed. Not one of them failed. God's word is true. God's word must be fulfilled. God's word must be fulfilled in our life. So Pilate now says to him, what is truth? What is truth? I gave you guys this handout because I thought we would dive into this and and really you guys got to just look at me or tell me something because this could turn into a whole other sermon some of y'all are like let's do it I I felt like this was just a warm-up other y'all are feeling like I got enough to chew on already let's do this I gave you guys this handout and if you look at page one it's the truth about truth Would you please bring up the first slide? The first thing is, truth does matter. Truth is absolute and it's not relative. That's what's going on in our day today is relativism. Relativism is hypocritical at best though. Because people who are relativists, they want absolutes when it comes to certain things in their life. They just want relativism when they want it to be relativism. So when everyone gets paid, they don't want relativism. No one wants to go to their boss and they'd be like, well, my check says, you know, this amount and we agreed on this amount. It was kind of like, well, I was going to use the calculator, but it's just kind of, look, it it still has the number eight in it. It might, you might expect an 8,000. This is just 800. Still got eight in it. It's got more The numbers are more similar than they're dissimilar. I just thought I would just give you a relative number, right? Do you like that? If you get on an airplane, do you want the pilot to come on and say, hey, you know, we're flying about 500 miles. Mm, We got gas. We got it. (laughs) We'll just see how it goes. So it's just so interesting that those that are into relativism in this new trend, they, they want absolutes when it deals to certain things, but it's when it comes to ethics, they want relativism. Oh, and you know, and this day, you know, road rage has got a lot of different flavors, but just what about the passive aggressive road rage of the person letting you know you were supposed to yield? Not a matter of, well, yield is such a, yellow lights are soft colors. You know, if you go, you don't go, whatever. Absolutes. Look, 
Truth is absolute, it's not relative. Here's just some other things. One, faith is not the foreign phenomenon many ascribe it to be. Uh, because to a certain degree, we all live by it day to day. When you get a paycheck with the company's name on it, and it's not yet greenbacks in your hand, and you already start paying bills and already start planning a vacation, you're placing faith in the credit of that name in the upper left-hand corner. That's faith. You get on an airplane, you're placing your faith in the laws of physics. You get on an elevator, and it says last inspected this day. You're putting faith in whoever put that up there, and even faith that they didn't think they were in the, another building, and actually that elevator's not been inspected, and that belongs in another building down the street. Everyone lives by faith. Faith is only as good as its object, right? Faith is by no means contrary to reason. What uh, many will say, and even the atheist camp will say, or sometimes assert, is that, hey, reason belongs to us. We're thinkers. We like to look at the reasons. Um, faith uh, goes against reason. So almost like, well, I was tired of thinking. Life's a thinking man's game. I just stopped thinking and just decided to take this blind leap of faith into the arms of Jesus. Christianity is absolutely logical and absolutely reasonable. We place our faith in historical phenomenon and in God who has made himself abundantly clear in many ways. Do you know that Linus Pauling, I believe his name is, received a Nobel Prize for his work as a chemist. He said, one living cell, one living cell is more complex than all of the electrical work in all of Manhattan. One living cell. And we're made up of what? How many trillions of cells? And then lastly, I love this, truth fears no questions. So Pilate says, what is truth, right? Can you look at the handout, please? Let's just look at eight points of the truth about truth. And all of this should again go right back to, if God's word is true, what are we doing with it? One, please look at the handout. All truth claims are absolute, narrow, and exclusive. How many have heard the attack leveled against Christianity that what we believe is narrow, that it's bigoted? Really, all truth claims are narrow, though. Even if you say all religions lead to God, that's a narrow statement, too, because you've just excluded the statement that Christianity is the only way, and the blood of Jesus Christ is the only way that leads to the Father. All truth claims are absolute. All truth claims are narrow, and all truth claims are exclusive. Christianity is not the only religion that claims to be the only way. Christianity is the only religion that is truth, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Look at C of point one. As another case in point, 2 plus 2 equaling 4 is narrow and exclusive. Why? Because of all the numbers that it can equal, there can only be one answer. 2 plus 2 can only equal 4. That's very narrow. So truth claims by definition are narrow, absolute, and exclusive. 2. Truth is discovered. It's not invented. Gravity existed prior to Isaac Newton. Uh, all the rest of math and physics, truth is truth. Truth is to be discovered, regardless of culture or historical context. Underline that. Truth is to be discovered, regardless of culture or historical context. Three, one's belief cannot change a fact, no matter how sincerely it is held. Isn't that true? One's belief cannot change a fact no matter how sincerely it is held. And look at the back of that paper. The very back of the page, because they're double-sided. A vast number of people believe that as long as you're sin sincere in what you believe, you'll make it to heaven. However, such a view is unsubstantiated on the grounds of establishing truth. Two plus two will not equal five no matter how sincere someone is. Point four, truth transcends culture. Transcends culture. Two plus two equals four, whether you're in Moscow, Peking, indigenous populated islands, even Mars. Here it is, point five. Being raised in a different culture doesn't necessarily make their beliefs true. 
In other words, although most people raised in a pantheistic culture may become pantheists, and most people in a polytheistic culture may become polytheistic, and most atheistic cultures may become atheists, and although culture can and does affect one's beliefs, nevertheless, that still does not make a certain belief truth. Why? Because based on the definition of truth, truth is only that which corresponds to the facts, only that which matches its object, and only that which tells it like it is. Matter of fact, look at point B, Adolf Eichmann, Hitler's right-hand man, tried to use that argument at the famous Nuremberg trials. He was responsible for the death of some 12 million people, and what he basically tried to say is that different cultures have different truths. I was raised in Nazism. I'm a product of my environment, so me senselessly killing all people who are non-Aryan, that is my truth because that is my culture. And basically the judge found that as a false standing and as full of lies and convicted him. Why? Because what the judge was saying is that truth transcends culture. Culture does not determine your truth no matter what it is. Here's a great one, point six. A bad attitude about truth doesn't make it error. A bad teacher of Christianity does not make Christianity false. <laughs> and a loving atheist does not make atheism true. Seven, the idea of objective truth cannot be denied. Because in denying that there's any objective truth, you just basically made an objective statement. So when someone says, uh, there are no absolute statements, uh, basically that's just an absolute statement. <laughs> Point eight, contrary beliefs are possible. They are, of course. But contrary truths are not possible. So please read on through the rest of the handout. Actually, you'll see um, I delved into human depravity, uh, the definition of sin, uh, the existence of evil, um, and uh, the, the, the mystery of evil. Uh, if God is good, why does evil exist? Uh, I decided instead of just giving out the points on truth, that I would just have the whole handout made so you actually can read this, um, right? If God is good, why does evil exist? Uh, please do read and mark up this handout, amen? But, but let's have the worship team come up now. And let's just take this time to celebrate. And if you could please go to the last slide. The last slide. Jesus says, I alone in contradistinction to all others, I am the road and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now doesn't that ring in an entirely new way now? God's word is true. Joshua, it says, not one promise fell to the ground or failed. Everything came to pass. All of this trial, as illegal and backwards as it is, it's going just the way it ought to go so that the scriptures will be fulfilled and nothing would be broken. God's word is true. God's word must be fulfilled. God's word must be fulfilled in my life. Can I just ask a question to make sure that we are definitely walking away with, with some practical homework? What are you going through right now? And are you grabbing your Bible intentionally or are you just grabbing it generally? You see, when I grab it generally, I'm going through something and I'm just basically opening it. First thing that I see, you, you know, a lot of people play that game. Okay, Lord, um, I'm going to open the Bible and whatever it says, that's what you're saying to me. Uh, here we go, you open it and it says, uh, and basically you shall all die tonight. Oh man, I'm going to die, you know. You know, I mean, people do a lot of stuff when they're alone. That's why it's good to come to church. Sometimes it rescues you from just being weird, Okay. <laughs> Kind of, someone's like, oh, I just got delivered. <laughs> I just got delivered. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> or, you know, I can come to the Bible with intentionality. Lord, this is what I'm going through. 
Lord, I need promises in your word. Lord, what does your word say for when I'm confused? What does your word say for when I'm, when I'm rightfully angry about something and what to do with that? Lord, what does your word say about healing? What does your word say about the corruption of my flesh? What does your word say about love uh, in the face of condemnation? Uh, what does your love say? What does your word say about my future? What does your word say? And it really comes down to whose report are you going to believe? What those around you say and what your own heart is saying and what the enemy is sowing into your thinking or what God's word says. So you've got to sit down and do some serious business. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you, sometimes you may not like the first answers that come out of your heart. But isn't that what gardening is all about? If I went out to my garden, and look, you come to my house come August, I'm going to give you a tomato. <laughs> I'm a, my goal is to give you a tomato that you could bite like an apple. Salt and pepper, and that's all you want. But I don't like what I see when I first walk into that garden. And if I turned around because I was not happy with what I first saw, I would never get to the harvest. I walk in there and there's some funky stuff growing. Some stuff, it's almost like the weed bites back when you touch it. You guys ever touch some of them? It's one thing to grab a weed. It's nothing to grab it and it done bit you. You're like, was that a bug? No, that weed bit me back. Sometimes you sit down, and this is where a lot of believers ne never get past go. You sit down and you, you, some stuff comes out of you biting back. Some real selfish, nasty, prideful, self-centered, hateful, bitter, arrogant, arrogant, self-satisfied. Hey, you know, all I really want is God's blessings, you know, and God, you better do this because I've worked hard on it and God owes me something. Stuff comes out. But you've got to be able to sit through that. And you've got to weed that out in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing that everything you're looking at has already been conquered. It's already been whacked through the risen Christ. And you've got to do business in your heart. That's why so many believers today are losing their joy because they're hanging up their gardening gloves. Oh yeah, there's a world to save out there. There's a lot of work to do and you know we pray to be about it. But in this day and age, the majority of that work has got to be done right here. And we can't afford to continue on and be the believers that say, Lord, other vineyards I've been taking care of, but my own vineyard I've been ignoring. And isn't God so good? He'll, 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 he'll gently remind us all when we've fallen into that. Hey, and then you realize, wait a minute. I have nothing to do today. Yeah, wait, I've been taking care of everybody. Wait, you don't, you don't know what to do for, at first. <laughs> then ideas come to mind. Maybe I'll take up a new hobby. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll, maybe I'll learn weaving. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll go rollerblade on Kelly Drive and buy rollerblades. But then you start realizing, you know what, Lord? No, you're giving me a moment to take care and to take care of this vineyard right here, right? So... Let's do this. Let's be practical. Yes, this is great. This is great for apologetics. This is great for sharing Christ and absolute truth with a world that wants to say everything is relative. But let's really just take to heart how to wage war in this walk. What that means is you guys should be grabbing some promises and you cling to them and you stand on them. Amen? Stand on them and stand on them and stand on them. Then you go up to someone else. Hey, man, this is some verses I got. Got any others that come to mind? Hey, here's some verses I have on this. Do you have any to add to that? Amen? And let's celebrate our Lord. You guys, you realize how loved you are. It's rocking me. Anyone in this room, you feel like he's just showing you in a whole new way how much he loves you? I mean, he is just, just when you thought you knew the four Greek words on love. He done, he done whopped you, molly whopped you with a whole new revelation of love. You feel like you're back in a high chair watching Jesus Sesame Street. You know, just eating applesauce, like more applesauce, please. Like he is, he does that kind of stuff. But you got to cooperate. Don't be that baby trying to, yo, watch that baby. That baby you strapped that baby in 1,800 times, leaps out of high chairs. Stay in that high chair and you eat that milk all over again. And you eat that applesauce. Sometimes you got to get back to the basics. You look at the trial and you're like, 
Not like, oh yeah, well, Caiaphas. And, uh, who, so who was Caiaphas and who was Annas? And, you know, what was, all that has its place. But it's like, Lord, you did that for me. Wow. Let's really, really, really just fall in love with the gospel all over again. Because that is going to be our strength in these days. That is going to be our strength. Remember, Jesus had a promise. He said his yoke is easy and his burden is light. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Our lives should be reflecting that. And if it's not, it's because we're trying to do it in our own strength. But when you let the gospel into every equation, you will come to understand more and more what it is. Amen. Father, thank you so much for this time today. Lord God, we love you so much. And we just ask that you would be pleased with what you see in this room, Lord. Your people on the edge of their seats just wanting to hear about your goodness. Your goodness toward us, Lord. Lord, thank you that in a world of relativism and shifting stories that we have truth. Thank you in a world where we can't even believe what we're told are credible news sources and, and, and a majority consensus where everything is overwhelmingly gray. Thank you that we have truth. Thank you, Lord, that nothing is new under the sun, Lord, and you reign over everything. Lord, thank you for the truth as it applies to our lives, to our hearts, to the plan you have for us, to our names in the book of life, that nothing can separate us from your love. Thank you for truth, Lord. So today, we just want to celebrate truth. And Lord, if we've been celebrating lies, show us where it's been happening unawares. Maybe we're celebrating lies in the music we bop our head to. Maybe we're celebrating lies in the movies we're addicted to. Maybe we're celebrating lies in the company we keep. Lord, you desire truth in the inward parts. Have your way. Lord, we also ask that you'd receive this afternoon's offering. And of all you've given unto us, thank you that we can now worship you with giving and give a portion to you, Lord. May it be used for gospel momentum, gospel dynamic to continue to touch our region and even our nation, Lord. Give us godly wisdom and fear with every penny. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.